So it describes the shape of a molecule, which really relates to its geometric figure. The geometric figures have characteristic corners that indicate the position of the surrounding atoms. The surrounding atoms always attach back to the central atom in the center of the geometric figure. That geometric figure will also have characteristic angles that we call bond angles. So thinking about how the atoms are connected in a three-dimensional way, and then taking a look at the angles between the atoms that attach back to the central atom. Now the Lewis theory of bonding, or the, the electron dot structure, also known as Lewis dot structure, predicts that there are regions of electrons in an atom. So some regions result from placing shared pairs of valence electrons between bonding nuclei. Other regions result from unshared valence electrons in a single nuclei. So just to illustrate, if we think about a water molecule, oxygen being the central atom, we know that there's two unbonded pairs of electrons, two unbonded pairs, and as well as two bonded pairs of electrons. So this region shows a non-symmetrical shape to a water molecule. Two bonded pairs and two non-bonded pairs create the shape of the overall molecule. And the Lewis dot theory, which really just helps us predict how the atoms bond together, will take a next step in thinking about the shape at which we're using to draw them. So as we think progressively in terms of the Lewis theory, those are the things we need to understand that if I have regions of electron groups, we know that electrons have like charges, they're both negative, they're going to repel each other. That idea can then be extended to predict the shapes of molecules. When we say the geometric shape is the position of atoms surrounding a central atom and will de be determined by the number of bonding groups and the number of non-bonding groups, knowing that we need to minimize the repulsions between non-bonding electrons. So what did I just say? Back to the water example, we need to minimize the repulsion. What possible angle can we place these electrons at to minimize how close they are together? So to minimize repulsions against like charges and to place them always back to a central atom, This theory is called the VSEPR theory. V-S-E-P-R stands for the Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion Theory, commonly referred to as VSEPR. How the electron groups place themselves around the central atom to create the most stable geometric shape. And by stable, we're trying to minimize the charges of any unbonded pairs of electrons, making sure that the atoms themselves have the greatest amount of room so what are those bond angles that create space? So that atoms, of course, take up space and shape. So we want to be sure to create a geometric arrangement and allow us to predict the shapes and the bond angles within a molecule. The valence shell electron pair repulsion theory helps us to start predicting geometric shapes. So in this slide, we're getting an idea via a picture. Suppose we have a central atom, and these electron groups are placed around the central atom. What we're showing is that electrons have repulsive forces. In other words, since this shared pair of electrons is negative and this shared pair of electrons are negative as well as the third, what possible bond angle can I place them at to create the largest space between them? And you're starting to see if I have three electrons uh, pairs around the central atom, we're starting to draw a triangle. So this trigonal shape here will give us the greatest room between the electron pairs. And that's all we really have to consider when we start predicting shapes of molecules, space them out. The Lewis structure predicts the number of valence electron pairs around a central atom. Each lone pair of electrons constitutes one electron group on a central atom. Each bond constitutes one electron group on a central atom regardless of whether it's a single, double, or triple. So here's what we've said. If this is the central atom, nitrogen, we call these electron domains is the correct vocabulary. How many electron domains are on the central atom, nitrogen? Well, the lone pair on top of nitrogen counts as one electron group is what our text calls them. Most texts call them electron domains. 
that's what you'll hear me say. So the first electron domain is up north on top of the nitrogen. A second electron domain is the bond between nitrogen and oxygen. The third electron domain is between the nitrogen and oxygen to the left. It says regardless of whether it's a single, double, or triple, that creates just one domain, one domain between the nitrogen and oxygen, even though it's a double bond. Now, the information we gather from this structure, the central atom is nitrogen. There are three electron domains, two of which are bonded, two bonded domains, and one unbonded domain. The direction in which we're heading is as easy as reading a chart. Three electron domains, two that are bonded, one that is not bonded, allows us to use the Vesper chart. And this is coming in our notes, but I'll just go ahead and kind of share. And let me kind of blow that up a little bit so we see it clear on the screen. Again, these are all the representative shapes that our text is going to take us through one at a time, kind of explaining how these uh, shapes form. Notice that what I'm giving you in a chart form is the electron domain geometry. Out of that, how many are bonded, how many are unbonded, and the shape of the molecule. In the previous example, we had three electron domains, two bonded, one unbonded. Using my chart, Three electron domains is best described as a trigonal planar geometry. Those are the electron domains. Think about it, if there's three points in a triangle, those would create the largest space between those electron domains. Now, out of those three electron domains, two were bonded, one was unbonded. The three domains, two bonded, one unbonded, create what's called a bent molecule. The bent molecule places the central atom at an angle of about 104.5 degrees and then that lone pair of electrons up on top. So if I think about taking this Lewis dot structure and showing what it looks like in terms of its geometry, we start spacing out in terms of molecular geometry. Giving a rough sketch, we end up with a true shape of our molecule in terms of this configuration. So last chapter, we practiced just drawing Lewis dot structures. What we're now trying to do is take a next step and say, okay, now what does it really look like in terms of a three-dimensional geometric shape? Spacing out the electron domains as far apart from each other, that's what the Vesper theory does. Valent shell electron pair repulsion theory. That's Vesper. Create bond angles to separate out with the maximum amount of space between them and this would be about 120 degrees for a bond angle. Electron group geometry, oh by the way, that's the direction we're heading, taking each one of these geometric shapes and just kind of going through examples of each. This is a chart from our text coming up in the notes one at a time. So just to show electron group geometry one at a time, we have five basic arrangements of electron groups around the central atom. Five different ways they can arrange themselves. They can be linear with two electron domains. They can be trigonal planar with three electron domains. And let me go ahead and make this just a little close up here. There we go. Two electron domains shown a linear ge geometry. Three electron domains, I can see a trigonal planar geometry. With four electron domains, we start to see a tetrahedral geometry. The fifth has five, one, two, three, the fourth shape has five electron domains. It's called a trigonal bipyramidal, trigonal bipyramidal shape. And the fifth has six electron domains. Octahedral will be the name of the six domains. This text, this chapter is just going to share with us one at a time each one of these and explain some examples of how we can create these shapes. But just to kind of put it all in one spot first, we have five different electron domain geometries based on bonding and non-bonding pairs. Within that number of electron domains, we start to visualize the three-dimensional structures of our molecules. 
So if we have linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, and octahedral as the five choices. Now that's really the whole chapter all on one sheet. The first of those five basic arrangements is what's being discussed here. So electron domains have five basic arrangements based on the maximum of six bonding electrons. Though there may be more than six on very large atoms, it is very, very rare. The most common is tetrahedral. You have to expand the octet to get five electrons or six electron domains. Each one of these five basic arrangements results in five different basic electron geometries. In order for the molecular shape and bond angles to be a perfect geometric figure, all of the electron groups must be bonds and all the bonds must be equivalent. Let me blow that back out here so we can see all in one slide. Again, we're on slide nine, just kind of reading through. So keeping in mind five basic shapes. For molecules that exhibit resonance, and that's more than one correct structure, drawing for our double bond to single bonds, it doesn't matter what resonance form you use. The electron geometry will be the same. Just to remind ourselves, residents occur if we have alternating double single bonds. We drew, as an example in the last chapter, the benzene molecule, C6H6, where we said the corners of this benzene ring were carbons, and alternating between the carbons were double single bonds. A resonance structure simply shows that I could change the location of those double bonds and really end up with the same structure. The resonance structure is really just the location between two equivalent equal points for double to single bonds. So thinking about electron domain, it really won't change the way that we arrange our atoms. The first of our five electron geometry domains is going to be called linear. Back to this sheet here, the linear electron domain with two electron domains from the central atom. When there are two electron groups around the central atom, they will occupy positions on opposite sides of the central atom. Again, if I have a center, I want to place the uh, electron domains as far apart from each other as possible, which of course would be a straight line of 180 degrees. This results in electron groups taking a linear geometry where the bond angle is 180. One example would be beryllium dichloride, beryllium chloride here, central atom of beryllium, and two electron domains, each of those being chlorine. Here's a second example of a linear geometry. Notice here carbon is the central atom, and even though these are double bonds, they still count as one electron domain. There are two electron domains, both are bonded. So looking at our chart, you can clearly see the only way to create a linear molecule, two domains, all are bonded. So there's zero non-bonding. It's got to be linear. Coming off of a central atom, going in opposite directions, we see a linear molecule. Carbon dioxide is linear. The linear geometry clearly shows a 180 degrees. This is just a picture showing uh, two balloons tied end to end create a linear electron cloud, linear geometry. The second of our five is called trigonal planar electron geometry. Just to go back to this chart, and I'm gonna keep showing this to kind of clarify the whole chapter in one spot. If there's three electron domains, the electron geometry would be trigonal planar. We can see two different molecular geometries based on how many bonding and non-bonding pair we have. So within the electron domain geometry of trigonal planar, there's two different molecular geometries. If we have all three bonded back to the central atom, we'll have it called trigonal planar. If only two of the three are bonded back, it will be a bent molecule. Trigonal planar and bent are the two possible molecular geometries for three electron domains having a trigonal planar electron geometry. Back to the PowerPoint, that's what this slide is showing. 
When there are three electron groups around the central atom, they will occupy positions in the shape of a triangle. The shape of a triangle creates the largest bond angle to separate those, as in boron trifluoride. Chapter 9 showed us the electron dot structure with bo uh, boron as the central angle, fluorines coming off in each direction. The jump from Chapter 9, from just connecting back to the central atom, to actually showing the geometry creates bond angles according to the Vesper theory. We want to separate those angles as far from we can to alleviate crowding within the molecule. Valence shell, electron pair repulsion. I want to separate them out. And if there's three, we can see the shape of a triangle with 120 degrees as a bond angle being the largest possible domain. And that's what this picture is showing here, a close-up of the trigonal planar geometry. Central atom, this would be boron trifluoride, a trigonal planar geometry. The next category would have four electron domains. Four is known as the tetrahedral. When there are four electron groups around the central atom, they will occupy positions in the shape of a tetrahedron around the central atom. The bond angle becomes 109.5 degrees. Thinking this through with this close-up picture, here's a picture on our uh, PowerPoint. This is on the handout. If we have four electron domains, the shape of the electron clouds around the central atom will be called tetrahedral. We can see within the tetrahedral electron domain geometry three possible molecular geometries based on the number of bonding and non-bonding domains. The tetrahedral shape, if all four are bonded, matches the molecular geometry. If we have three bonded and one non-bonded pair, it's called trigonal pyramidal. And if out of the four, two are bonded and two are non-bonded, the shape becomes a bent molecule. There are three molecular geometries that share the same electron domain geometry called tetrahedral, based on the number of bonded and non-bonding pairs. The tetrahedral geometry shows four electron clouds, electron domains around the central atom. Tetrahedral geometry shows a tetrahedron with angles of 109.5. We might choose to add these onto the chart. We said these were 180 degrees for linear. That a triangle has 120 degrees, trigonal planar triangle. And now we're seeing here 109.5 for the bond angles in a tetrahedron. When there are five electron groups, again going back to the handout, we have trigonal bipyramidal. Five electron domains, trigonal bipyramidal becomes the shape. Notice on our handout that there are one, two, three, four possible molecular geometries within the electron domain called trigonal bipyramidal. If all five are bonded, it's known as trigonal bipyramidal. If four are bonded and one is non-bonded, we have a shape called seesaw. If three are bonded, two non-bonded, it's called T-shaped. And if two are bonded with three unbonded pairs, it will create a linear molecular geometry. Four possible molecular geometries when we have five electron domains. The electron domain geometry is known as trigonal bipyramidal. The resulting groups of electrons, when there are five, takes on a shape of trigonal bipyramidal geometry. The positions above and below the central atom are called the axial positions. Placing my paper back on to show the axial positions, 
Notice here in this first picture the B is standing for whatever the ligand is, boron perhaps. The ones that are 180 degrees around, just exactly top and bottom of each other, are called the axial position. Axial. Notice here there are three that spin around an equator. These look more like the triangle from the trigonal planar geometry a moment ago. The three that are 120 degrees apart are called the equatorial position. Here's what we're saying. Between the equatorial and the axial position, this is a 90 degree bond angle, between an equatorial to another equatorial, those are 120 degrees for the bond angle. Let me blow that up so you get a closer look. There are, oh, there's my phone. There are two sets of bond angles, straight up and down, 180 degrees from top to bottom, known as the axial position. There are three that create a triangle around the equator of the central atom. A triangle has 120 degrees as a bond angle. From top to bottom would be 180. From a top to an equatorial, the axial to equatorial would be a 90 degrees. So there's two different bond angles in the trigonal bipyramidal electron domain. So the bond angle between equatorial, 120. The bond angle between an axial and equatorial is a 90 degree bond angle and zoom back out to see those already typed for us there. In this diagram, you can see a continuation of the picture where it's showing two different bond angles when we have five electron domains. Trigonal bipyramidal, recall that we have what's called an axial position and the equatorial position. The axial positions are straight up and down. I can see a balloon up top and a balloon down below. There are three electron domains that position themselves around the equator, known as the equatorial position. And we can see that they uh, take the shape of a triangle, giving us 120 degrees. And then between the axial and equatorial would be 90. Between the top axial position and all the way down to the bottom, I would see a 180 degree from top to bottom. The trigonal bipyramidal geometry shows two different positions. In this example, we see phosphorus pentachloride. Phosphorus is our central atom with one, two, three, four, five chlorines attached to it. Phosphorus would extend its octet and create PCl5. Top to bottom are the axial positions, and there are three equatorial positions. Exactly 90 degrees between an axial and an equatorial, and the positions of a triangle here would be the 120 degrees. Another shot of the same thing, showing axial top and bottom with the trigonal planar here, giving us those three equatorial positions. The next electron cloud geometry is called octahedral. We started with linear, talked about trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, and now we're to the six electron domains called the octahedral. Taking a closer look before we go into the PowerPoint, there are three possible molecular geometries that have the electron domain of octahedral. If all six of the bonding pairs are bonded back to the central atom, it will be called octahedral. If five of the six electron domains are bonded, leaving one unbonded, it will be called square pyramidal. And if the six electron domains, if four are bonded and two are unbonded, it ends up to be square planar three possible molecular geometries for one electron domain that has octahedral shape. So when there are six electron groups around the central atom, and again, we've expanded the octet around the central atom to create room for six bonded pairs, we'll see it takes the shape of 
octahedral geometry. All positions are equivalent and gives us a 90 degree bond angle. Putting this back on the screen, we can see between any position, we would have a 90 degree bond angle. You can see, just to put this back a moment, there's two axial positions, top and bottom, but now I see four equatorial positions, making a square around that center, and a square, of course, has a right angle, that's a 90 degree. It would be 90 degree from an axial to an equatorial. So in any direction, a 90 degree. Although from top to bottom, the two axial positions would have a 180 degree bond angle. All positions are equivalent. Here's a picture of the octahedral geometry. Again, showing six electron domains. Two of them are top and bottom, and four placed around in the equatorial position. We have an axial position and the equatorial position, creating an octahedron. A molecule such as sulfur hexafluoride, SF6, sulfur the central atom. I can see the fluorine top and bottom, and I can see four around the equator the axial positions and the equatorial positions. Sulfur hexafluoride has octahedral geometry. Slide 23 shows yet another opportunity to visualize this with molecular models. Looking at sulfur in the center, two fluorines on top, and we can see the four positions around the equator, sulfur hexafluoride. The actual geometry of the molecule may be different from the electron geometry. When the electron groups are attached to the atoms a different size, or when the bonding to one atom is different than the bonding to another, it'll affect the molecular geometry. And lone pairs of electrons affect molecular geometry. They occupy space at the central atom, but are not seen as points in terms of molecular geometry. This slide really, in my head, just introduced the concept that we've been stating with this picture. We went through in the beginning of the PowerPoint what are called electron domains, and I just touched on the fact that the electron domain may or may not match the actual molecular geometry. The only time it does match is if all the bonding uh, of all the electron domains are indeed bonded. So what we just introduced was the fact that the electron domain tells me how many electrons are going to back to the central atom, but we also have to consider how many are bonded and how many are unbonded when we decide the molecular geometry. Here's what we're looking at slide 25. Let me get this focused here. Carbon is the central atom. I have an electron domain heading north, one to the left and one to the right. I have three electron domains. Of those three, all are bonded. I would expect, looking at my uh, VSEPR chart, a trigonal planar geometry with 120 degrees, as written earlier, for the bond angle. A three, three, zero. Three electron domains, three are bonded, zero non-bonded. But notice what's happened. We have a little bit of a difference here between the, the uh, predicted 120. And here's what's happened. See this double bond from the carbon up to the oxygen? Double bonds, remember, are two sets of electron clouds. These literally take up more room and are going to push the hydrogen away just a little further. So the predicted bond angle of 120 expands. And the reason is this double bond, those are a lot of electrons and they're needing to expand away from each other. So the moral of this story is, if I see a double bond, it's going to push down a little. We're thinking about 120, it's actual measurements, 121.9. And if I squish the hydrogen closer together, we've lost a little bit. We would have predicted 120, but it's a little smaller. Double bonds push out and they expand just a little bit beyond 120 we would have expected, creating a smaller bond angle between the hydrogens. Because the bonds and atom sizes are not identical in formaldehyde, the observed angles are slightly different from the ideal. 
if I had a central atom and it all had three single bonds all created equal, I could predict with confidence 120 in each direction. It's when I have some unique bond compared to the others. A double bond is unique compared to two singles. It's going to push the hydrogen further or, or closer together, therefore decreasing the bond angle here, but increasing it here. Lone pairs of electrons do the same thing. A lone pair group occupy more space on the central atom. They're clouds of electrons. Because the electron density is exclusively on the central atom, rather than on shared pairs like bonding electrons, they need more size. So the relative size of repulsive force interaction goes like this. A lone pair to lone pair is greater than a lone pair to a bonding pair, which is greater than bonding to bonding. This affects bond angles, making the bonding pair or bonding pair angle smaller than expected. Let's take a peek that way. Oops, this typed over each other. Let's suppose we have a nuclei and we have a lone pair and a bonded pair. What we're looking at is a little different effect on the bond angle. This might be easier. Let's take a look at this picture where we actually can have something in common to look at. This is a picture of nitrogen with a perfect geometry of 109.5. And let me clarify where we're finding that. In a tetrahedral, where all four are bonded back, none are unbonded, we get a perfect bond angle of 109.5. In a tetrahedron, these space out with 109.5. But suppose we have a one unbonded pair. The lone pair of electrons is a cloud of electrons up on top. What would we expect to happen from this perfect 109.5 to creating a cloud up here on top of the nitrogen? Well, again, what happens? The electron cloud just takes a little more room and it's going to push down the hydrogen. So I'm going to create a bond angle that's a little greater in this direction than the 109.5. Therefore, it's pushing together the hydrogen a little. It's a little smaller than expected when we place a lone pair. Take a look at water. If water, central atom is oxygen here, what we end up with water is two unbonded pairs of electrons and two that are bonded. A perfect tetrahedron has 109.5, but now the two bond angles squish those hydrogen even closer together. The electron clouds simply take more room, and therefore they spread out and push together the hydrogens. So the 104.5 is the expected bond angle here. So here's what we've said. If I go back to this slide, 109.5 would be the bond angle when all are bonded. We then said it decreases to about 107 degrees if it's 3, 1 of a bonded pair. And if it's coming back here, if in water, taking this slide off and back to water, if two are bonded and two are non-bonded, we go to the bent geometry, 104.5 becomes this bond angle. Tetrahedrons have four electron domains. If all four are bonded equally, we get the expected bond angle of 109.5. If three of the one are bonded, it decreases slightly to 107. And if we have two to two, bonding to non-bonding, it decreases a little more to 104.5. Again, the electron cloud taking up a little more room to spread out to create the, the least amount of repulsive forces. And that's what we've shown here. A derivative of trigonal planar geometry is the bent molecule. A derivative of the trigonal planar geometry is the bent molecule. If two of the three electron domains are bonded, one is non-bonded, we get a bent molecule. And the bond angle changes a little bit. So if I think about trigonal planar being bent, that means two are bonded and one is unbonded in terms of this particular shape. 
So sulfur dioxide has three different possible resonance structures. That's what they're showing you, resonance between the three different uh, molecules, three different possible correct answers of how to draw the Lewis dot structure. The bond angle is going to be a little less due to those electron clouds right up here. So if we predicted on our VSEPR chart that the trigonal planar was 120 degrees, if I have a lone pair of electrons, it's going to be a little less than 120 degrees between these attached borons. So again, the electron cloud expands, pushing down or pushing closer together for that uh, electron domain, giving us a smaller than expected molecular geometry. Pyramidal and bent molecular geometries are derivatives of the tetrahedron electron geometry. When there are four electron groups, all four are bonded, we create a pyramidal shape. We can also have a bent shape as I'm just reading through this slide. Here's what we're looking at going back to the Vesper chart I gave you. When we have a tetrahedron electron geometry, Go to this chart, and here's all this slide is saying. If all four are bonded, the electron domain matches the molecular geometry, gives us an expected angle of 109.5. If three are bonded, one is not, we get an expected molecular geometry of trigonal pyramidal, a bond angle slightly smaller, about 107. And if two are bonded, two are not, we get a bent molecule with about a 104.5 bond angle, as in a water molecule. There are three possible molecular geometries for the tetrahedral electron domain geometry. And that's what I'm looking at with this slide here. Here's a picture of a methane molecule, perfectly symmetrical. We would call that a nonpolar molecule. Look up, look down, look left, look right. They're all equal hydrogens, a perfect molecular geometry of 109.5 for a bond angle. However, if we look at a tetrahedron for electron domain, still has four electron domains, but now I have a non-bonded pair as in ammonia, and H3 is ammonia. Central atom has three hydrogens, picture the electron cloud up on top pushing down a little bit. Instead of the predicted 109.5, this would have a little smaller bond angle between the hydrogens closer to 107. This would be called the trigonal pyramidal shape. When three are bonded, one is not bonded, trigonal pyramidal. Same picture, different example. Arsenic in the center, fluorine around the outside. Three fluorines attached back, but we have one lone pair. Four electron domains, so the electron do domain geometry is tetrahedral, but when three are bonded, one is not. The molecular geometry does not match. Tetrahedron for the electron domain, trigonal pyramidal for the molecular geometry, predicted bond angle about 107 smaller than the predicted 109.5. A second derivative of the tetrahedron could be a bent shape. And again, here's a water molecule showing two lone pairs of electrons with the connected hydrogens. The molecular geometry ends up bent. The electron domain geometry is tetrahedral. When I have four electron domains, Two are bonded, two are not bonded. We have a bent molecule. Predicted bond angles, 104.5. Again, same picture, different example other than water. Here's chlorine hooked to two oxygen, carrying a minus one charge. This is a polyatomic ion called hypo, no, it's called chlorite, ClO2, negative one is chlorite. Four electron domains. Two are bonded, two are not bonded, we create a bent molecule. Expected bond angle, 104.5 between the oxygens. Because what I'm not seeing in this particular ball and stick model are the two electron domains that are not bonded. The VSEPR chart shows four electron domains, two bonded, two non-bonded, I can predict the bent shape.
derivatives of trigonal bipyramidal electron geometry. Here's what this slide is showing. One at a time, I can show all of this slide. You can read through it, but this is what it's looking like. Derivatives of the shape really is just showing the possible connections between those five electron domains. Trigonal bipyramidal, if all five are bonded, the molecular geometry matches the electron domain geometry. The derivatives take off a bonding pair. If only four of the five are bonded, leaving one non-bonded, the shape becomes a seesaw. Notice that the non-bonded pair is taking from the equatorial position. The second derivative or possible molecular shape of the five electron domains, three are bonded, two are not bonded. This is called T-shape. Again, taking off a second electron domain from the equatorial position. And the third possible derivative of the trigonal bipyramidal geometry is a two-bonded, three non-bonded, giving us a linear. Notice that all three of those came from the equatorial position. So I can clearly see the axial position being left with 180 degrees for that bond angle between the top and bottom ligand. So here's what we're looking at. When five electron domains are present, but only four are bonded, one is not bonded, we get a seesaw shape. When the five electrons around the central atom have two lone pairs, we call it T-shaped. And if all three of the equatorial positions have been removed, we get what's called a linear shape. The derivatives of electron domains of trigonal bipyramidal. The axial lone pair does not occur, and I've stated that earlier. We remove, when we're going to have an electron cloud, remove it from the equatorial position. And again, that's important just to minimize uh, electron repulsive forces. If I place one on top, we're not alleviating as much crowding as if I removed it from the side. So the first to be removed would be one of the equatorial, then a second, and then a third. So again, remove from the equatorial positions when we're creating the derivatives of the five electron domains known as trigonal bipyramidal. A closer look at seesaw. In a seesaw shaped, this is interesting, they've removed one, but here I would flip it this way to see what they've done. If this is a molecule, it was SF. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, SF5, sulfur pentafluoride. When I remove to go to a seesaw, I take an equatorial position. So I would not take off either the axial, but always remove one from the equatorial position to create a seesaw. And literally, when we build these, it's like having a leg. Um, the sulfur atom, and these two would just be sitting flat on the table. I can place a person here, a person here, and you can go up and down like a seesaw would. And that's where it gets its name from, a seesaw shape. The T-shape of this particular electron domain is still a trigonal bipyramidal. One, two, three, four, five electron domains. But notice I've removed two then from the equatorial position, and it now looks like a T-shape, bond angle of 90 degrees in either direction. So here's the letter T when I make this molecular shape. T-shaped is a five electron domains, two non-bonded, three bonded back to the central atom. Bond angle here, 109, or, excuse me, just 90 degrees. 180 from top to bottom, 90 degrees here. Here's an example of a T-shaped molecule. Five electron domains, three of them bonded to fluorine, two non-bonded pair, the T-shaped giving us a linear fashion here and straight down. So I can see the letter T with that particular shape. If it's linear, we had three electron domains that are unbonded. And again, all three are taken from the equatorial position, giving us a 180 degree between the two that are left and the axial position. Xenon difluoride would be an example here. Moving on to the octahedral electron geometry. Again, on our page, this focus here, where we have six electron domains. 
If all six are bonded, we can see that the electron domain geometry and the molecular geometry would match to be octahedral. If I remove one of the bonded pair, we get square pyramidal. And if I remove, remove two of the bonded pair, we get a square planar. Let's take a peek. When there are six electron groups around the central atom and some are lone pairs, even number lone pairs will take a position opposite the previous lone pair. When there are six electron groups around the central atom and one is a lone pair, the resulting is a square pyramid. The bond angles between axial and equatorial position is less than 90. Let's take a peek of what they just said. The first one to be removed is an axial position. The bond angle in any direction, recall, is 90 degrees. If this is an electron pair that's not bonded, that's a big cloud, and so they're saying it's going to push those other to be a little less than the 90 degrees. A moment ago up here, just to stress, the trigonal bipyramidal, we always remove from the equatorial position. Down here, the octahedral, if I remove one, the second one is going to go the exact opposite location. Now remember, this particular molecule is completely symmetrical. So when I say axial, I could flip it. Now, I mean, truly, they're the corners of an octahedron. Wherever I take one off, the, the second one to be removed goes in the exact opposite. So just follow through the straight line. Here's a straight line, here's a straight line, here's a straight line. That's an octahedron. Whatever one you remove first to create a, squ a square pyramidal, the second one that's removed is the exact opposite end of that same line. Really doesn't matter which one you choose to remove because all of these are created equal. There are no differences in bond angles as there were up here in the five electron domain. So take off any one to go from octahedron to square pyramidal, but when you remove a second one, make sure that it's exactly the opposite. In other words, it's going to be the other atom from the same straight line in the octahedron. And that's what this slide is really saying. Bond angles between axial and equatorial are all 90 degrees. So if you remove one electron pair to create what's called the square pyramidal, the second will be, uh, create a square planar shape. Square pyramidal, I still have a square around the axial, excuse me, around the equatorial position with a pyramid coming to the top. I can see a triangle up here. Square planar, all I have left is the square around the equatorial position. Take a peek at some models here. Octahedron electron geometry shows six electron pairs. If one of them is non-bonded, I can take off any of them and create a non-bonded pair. This is coming from the uh, axial position. The second one must be removed then from the opposite of the straight line. So here's the equator. All of those stay intact. If I remove one, the electron domain is octahedral. Molecular geometry, square pyramidal. If I take off two, I take off the one that is in the same straight line. Xenon tetrafluoride shows two electron domains that are unbonded. Molecular geometry is called octahedral. Molecular geometry now shows a, squain, a square planar molecular geometry. I can see the square as I build these. Here, finally, in our text is what I handed you earlier, putting all of these kind of in, in one spot. I start with the linear electron domain, trigonal planar electron domain, tetrahedral electron domain. And again, a little later on in your text, you'll see the number five and number six, the um, trigonal bipyramidal and octahedral. But finally, on slide 46, they're giving you this half of what I gave you earlier from a different text, all in one spot with bond angles, molecular geometry, and electron domain geometry. Probably a handier tool, I think, than the one in our text. All righty. Predicting the shapes around central atoms. 
If we draw the Lewis structure first, and that's a chapter 9 skill, we determine the number of electron groups around the central atom, classify each electron as either bonded or non-bonded, and simply count. Remember that multiple bonds count as one group. We use our table called the Vesper table to determine the shape and the bond angles. So it's as easy as drawing, but that in there lies the rub, I would imagine. How, how good are we here drawing our Lewis dot structures from chapter 9? Let's suppose we want to draw a molecule, phosphorus trichloride, PCl3. We're to draw the Lewis dot structure first, and all we've done is tabulated how many valence electrons we have to work with. So step one, phosphorus, it's P, who lives in group 5A, has five valence electrons. Chlorine lives in group 7A, so it has seven valence electrons, but there's three of them there. 21 plus 5 gives us a total of 26 valence electrons. So by the time I'm done drawing, I better be able to account for 26 electrons. Determine the number of electron groups around the central atom. And again, the central atom between phosphorus and chlorine, think symmetry. I always put the one I have just one of, place it in the center. Phosphorus becomes the central atom, and I'm going to build around it to create a symmetrical looking molecule. Always build back to the central atom. When I place phosphorus in the center, I place four electron groups around phosphorus. And you can see that here, they've done one, two, three, representing a bonded pair, and then here's a lone pair. So I begin kind of getting the structure. What I've then done is assigned the electron pairs around chlorine to finish their octet. So every atom in this pair has eight electrons. Two electrons represented by a dashed line because that's a shared pair of electrons. Two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four. Where did the other two go? Oh, down here. Step three. Classify the electron groups. Are they bonded or are they non-bonded? For phosphorus trichloride, I can clearly see three bonded and one non-bonded pair of electrons. Once I've classified three bonded and one non-bonded, I simply use my Vesper chart. Four electron domains, so the electron domain geometry is tetrahedral. Of the four, three are bonded and one is non-bonded. We can classify this as trigonal pyramidal with a bond angle of 107 degrees. Trigonal pyramidal have bond angles less than 109.5, which we recorded earlier as 107. Again, the lone pair of electrons pushing those chlorines a little bit closer together, expanding the cloud up on top of the phosphorus. So really, all we're saying, and it's going to be one practice after the next, we've got to build the correct Lewis dot structure, simply count the number of bonded and unbonded pairs, bring it over to your Vesper chart, and simply read it. The electron domain geometry, then I find the number of bonded to non-bonded pairs, and I can find very quickly the molecular geometry. You practice. Predict the molecular geometry of bond angles in SIF5. Again, thinking about the number of at or electrons, silicon, who lives in group 4A, and it will be the central atom. Fluorine, who lives in group 7A, but there's five of them. The negative one here gives me one extra electron. So 39 plus 1, I've got 40 electrons to place around the silicon. Silicon and I see five fluorines. So what I do is automatic and expand the octet. I've got to attach five fluorines back to silicon. The only way to do that is to create five single lines to attach them. And let's see what we have so far. So there's the five fluorines. 
We've expanded the octet for silicon and created a spot to attach all five fluorines. If we place seven, well, six more dots, giving us plus one to attach back, we get the total of seven that fluorine had. So two, four, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40. Each line counts as two electrons. We've just placed 40 electrons around the central atom. Sil or silicon pentafluoride with a minus one. That minus one says you get one extra electron to place in, so that's where I totaled up 40. We expanded the octet to create bonding positions for all five fluorine. Now it's as simple as reading a chart. Five electron domains, all five are bonded, leaving zero unbonded. Using my Vesper chart, I look up five, five, zero. Five electron domains, five bonded, none unbonded, I have a trigonal bipyramidal molecular shape. Trigonal bipyramidal. Let's see if we were right. Trigonal bipyramidal. Perfect. We expanded the octet. This is like the before and after slide. Not realizing the answer was right on the next slide, I drew it out. Alrighty. Again, a couple of things. If we have an extra electron, you're going to see that negative one charge. You get to add one in, giving us a total of 40. Thinking about bond angles, again, I didn't draw mine with the correct geometry, but I could, knowing that we have uh, two axial positions and then three equatorial positions. Predict the geometry and bond angles of PCL3. I think we did this slide. Darn it, 49, 50. I went backwards. My bad. Let's go forward. Predict the molecular geometry in CLOF2. O2F. CLO2F. Must be a long day. Chlorine, central atom. Fluorine, oxygen, oxygen. Totaling the number of electron pairs, again, this is a Chapter 9 skill, just coming up with an electron um, Lewis dot structure. We could see that of the central atom, three are bonded, one is not bonded. So I would look on my Vesper chart, four, three, one. Four electron domains, three are bonded, one is non-bonded, giving us a shape of trigonal pyramidal. To show that on the chart, 4, 3, 1, trigonal, pyramidal, with a bond angle of 107, which they're just saying here is less than 109.5, but we could be more exact. It's going to be 107 degrees. Representing three-dimensional shapes on a two-dimensional surface, how do we show molecular geometry, paper and pencil drawing? What we come up with is, is kind of a, a format to show is it coming out of the paper or going into the paper? And we're going to do that with straight lines if they're in the same plane as the paper, a solid wedge if it's coming out of the paper at you, and a hashed line, I usually call that a dashed line, hashed line going into the paper. So for instance, if I'm trying to actually show some three-dimensional on a two-dimensional world, we start to get a look like this. Linear, of course, would be a, a, right in the same plane. Trigonal planar, all in the same plane. They're going to lie flat on the table, and so will a bent molecule. But finally, I start to see things that I need to represent coming in and coming out of the paper, as in a tetrahedron. If A represents the central atom, I have to show one coming, one coming out and one going into the back of the paper, and that's all they're showing you is when you see these solid lines, that's coming out at you, and if it's going back into the paper, you're going to see that dashed line there. And if they're all represented as, uh, you know, just in the same plane as a piece of paper, you'll just see a straight, normal-looking bond. So dashed lines here represent going into the paper, behind the paper, if you will. 
coming out at you will be these dark solid hash marks. And then of course it's just really trying to show molecular geometry in a flat piece of paper. With this particular model, we have one, two, three, four, five, six electron domains. All six are bonded, so we would read six, six, zero. Six, six, zero gives us an octahedral shape. To best represent, there's two fluorines going back behind the paper, two fluorines coming out of the paper, and the top and bottom fluorine would be parallel on the same plane as the paper. Again, just to kind of share with you how we're showing molecular geometry in a two-dimensional world. Suppose we have larger molecules that have multiple central atoms, and that's more common than not. Many molecules have large structures with many interior atoms, and we can think of them as having multiple central atoms. We just simply talk about the molecular geometry around one central atom at a time. So here, one, two, three carbons in a chain, looking at this particular molecule. I can talk about this central atom. It looks like one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four electron domains. So we call this one a tetrahedral. Here, the center here, one, two, three. This central atom has three electron domains. Notice they're drawn in a, a, a double bond but one, two, three electron domains. So around here, this would be trigonal planar. And this central atom has only two. It is a bent molecular geometry. And what you're not seeing here is the two oxygen pairs. So really this is four, two, two, giving us bent oxygen with two that are bonded, two that are non-bonded, giving us a bent molecule. So with purpose of this slide is to remind you that even large molecules, we still only consider one region of the molecule at a time. Here's methanol, CH3OH. The molecular geometry around the carbon would be tetrahedral. It has four, four, zero. Here's the oxygen. Oxygen has four, two, two four electron domains, two that are bonded, two that are not bonded, giving us a bent molecule. Two central atoms, two different answers for the molecular geometry. Yet another example of a large molecule called glycine, one of our amino acids. We have nitrogen, one, two, three that are bonded, one non-bonded, so the molecular geometry here would be four, three, one, trigonal pyramidal. Here's carbon, one, two, three, four, four that are bonded, all four geometry here, so tetrahedral, four, four, zero. This carbon has three electron domains. One, two, three are bonded, three, three, zero, gives us trigonal planar. The oxygen, four electron domains, two that are bonded, two that are not bonded, giving us a bent molecular geometry. The pattern is the same. Each area of the molecule has its own unique molecular geometry. You cannot be asked for the entire structure with one correct answer. You turn the video off a moment, pause, and predict H3BO3. Find the molecular geometries. When you're ready, you started the video back up and can see the next slide. We have boron in the center. We have an OH group here, an OH group here, and an OH group up top as well. So boron serving as the central atom. H3BO3, the O's and the H's attach back. So here, Boron is trigonal planar. This is the boron, central atom, one, two, three, so its electron uh, geometry look like three, three, zero. The oxygen's all created equal. Remember that there's lone pairs of electrons, so this goes back to four, two, two, a bent molecular geometry.
This one is bent, this one is bent, this one is bent with four, two, two overall. So this structure here of boron as the central atom and then three equal subgroups coming off of that central atom. For molecules to be polar, it must have polar bonds, which means that there's electronegativity difference. The bond has dipole moments, which means there's an unequal sharing of electrons. Perhaps the easiest way to recognize if a molecule is polar is by looking at its symmetry. If I look at a molecule and it is not symmetrical, in other words, I look on every direction of electron domain, and if something is unique, it's a polar molecule. If it's perfectly symmetrical, we know it to be a nonpolar molecule. Thinking really in terms of symmetry makes polarity prediction quite easy. If I look at a molecule such as HCl, it's a linear molecule, it's only two dots connected by a straight line, but chlorine is more electronegative than the hydrogen, making this a polar bond. The hydrogen is barely hanging on to the chlorine in this a covalent bond. It's, it's just an unequal shared pair. A little positive sign at the end of this arrow shows the direction of the electron pull, leaving hydrogen partially positive and the chlorine partially negative. And we can see the electron distribution of this uh, molecular pair, leaving a partial positive on the hydrogen with a low electron density, a partial negative on the chlorine with a very high electron density. And these are probably colored in our actual PowerPoint showing red uh, coming from green over here. We could definitely see a polar molecule. If I have a linear molecule in which I have two identical polar bonds, it's going to be a nonpolar molecule. If I have a molecule with a bent geometry, it will end up being polar. If I have a molecule in a trigonal planar molecular geometry, nonpolar, they all cancel out. Tetrahedrons are nonpolar if all of the ligands are exactly the same. Trigonal pyramidal will have an exposed pair of electrons at the top, making it a polar molecule. So molecular polarity in terms of symmetry. If I have a carbon with only two electron domains, as in carbon dioxide, the carbon in the center is being equally pulled toward the oxygen in each direction, creates a perfectly symmetrical molecule. Carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule. The colored version of this slide might do a nicer job to show an equal distribution of the electron cloud around that central molecule there. So carbon dioxide, nonpolar, two electron domains, both heading into the same direction equally creates an equal pull. Water, however, is a bent molecule. It's bent because the electron domain went four, two, two. Four electron domains, two bonded, two non-bonded. There's electron clouds up here. If I look up, I see electrons. I look down, I see hydrogens. It is not a symmetrical molecule, so it creates an area on the oxygen that's mostly negative, leaving the hydrogens partially positive. A bent molecule is a polar molecule, the dipole moment being pulled towards the electron cloud, leaving hydrogens with a net positive and oxygen with a net negative electron density. Predicting the polarity of molecules. Draw the Lewis structure and determine the molecular geometry. Determine whether the bonds in the molecule are polar. And again, that's by electronegativity difference. To be honest, here's as easy as this. If I have like elements, fluorine minus fluorine, the electronegativity difference is zero. It is nonpolar. If I subtract any other two elements that are not the same, I'm going to get a small electronegativity difference. Determine whether the polar bonds add together to give a net dipole moment. Think symmetry. Predict whether ammonia is a polar molecule. Once I draw the Lewis dot structure for ammonia, I can simply go, oh, 
not symmetrical. I have a pair of electrons. If I look left, right, and down, I see hydrogens. But I'm looking north, I see electrons. It's not symmetrical. This would be a polar molecule. Electron domain is four. Three are bonded, one non-bonded. When I have four, three, one, I create an electron repulsive force on the top of the nitrogen. This trigonal pyramidal creates a polar molecule. Electron cloud up here, given it partially negative. The hydrogens end up partially positive, and you literally see that electron density being pulled up towards the nitrogen. And here's what we did the easy way. They found the electronegativity difference. Using our text, we just simply found the electronegativity value for nitrogen, 3.0. Electronegativity difference for hydrogen, 2.1. We subtracted and found 0.9. Therefore, it's considered to be a polar covalent bond. Electronegativity numbers are found in our text. We simply subtract those to find the difference. Let me get the phone and I'll pause.